We work U.S. military interest within the alliance. And that's everything from things that we want to see happen to things we're working with our allies. But our job is to represent U.S. military interest uh, in the alliance and represent the chairman. It sounds very political. It's a combination of both. For us, we try and keep it very pure, and, and it's military advice. And for the U.S. delegation, we're able to do that. You also have the political side, and that's with Ambassador Lute, and he represents the political uh, position of the United States. Because we are separate organizations, we have the freedom of action to actually provide that military advice that's not being influenced or pressured from a political side, if you would. If everything works the way it's supposed to work within our processes, we do the interagency, where you have all the elements of our government that come figure out what the final policy is going to be. And then when you have a military aspect, of, you have a political aspect, they're synchronized. And then we work that through the military committee on the military side, and then Ambassador and his folks work it through at the North Atlantic Council on the NAC side. It's one of those uh, really fascinating jobs because you're dealing with all aspects of not just the military advice, but understanding the political and the policy and all the other things that go with it. And then multiply that by 27 because you've got 27 other nations that are doing the same thing. NATO has relied heavily on the U.S. for leadership in the past and to a certain degree even today. How do we strengthen leadership capacity of other members in NATO? It's a great question, first of all. And there's really two avenues as I look at it after the last two and a half years of doing this job. One is within the NATO uh, international military staff itself at NATO headquarters in Brussels. And what I've seen over time if some of the newer nations or some of the smaller nations are actually getting some of these key positions within the military staff. To me, that's wonderful because it, it, it forces that, that interaction with all the alliances and it gives them the opportunity to kind of get that experience. When you look at today's environment, uh, especially with uh, the actions by the Russians in Ukraine and Crimea and some of the things that they've been doing uh, that have actually really concerned our eastern allies, you had a few nations up front, U.S. being one of them, that were kind of taking the lead. We've seen other nations now actually come to the forefront, like land units. We have other nations that are saying, hey, we'll provide the brigade for the very high readiness joint task force. We'll do this. We'll do that. Uh, U.S., hey, we'd like you to provide some enabler support, but this is a European issue, a European concern within the alliance. We need to be taking the lead. So we've actually seen some of the nations come up and do that. That's been a pretty positive aspect, especially when I look back two and a half years ago, you really did not see that. Still some challenges, though. Let's talk about defense budgets. How does this impact what we do in NATO planning? It's a huge impact. Uh, coming out of the Wales Summit, uh, there was an agreement by all 28 nations that we would uh, maintain at, as a minimum a 2% defense budget. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't at the 2%, we would strive to, number one, stop the bleeding and then over a time span of 10 years or so, get up to that 2% or better. We've seen some nations that have actually, especially when you look at our Baltic allies, that have, are almost at 2% or at 2% and working forward. We've seen other nations that have met the, uh, the agreement that was at the Wales Summit, and we've seen some nations that have come off the Wales Summit. It's a continuing, continuous dialogue that we have, and it's really on the political side. I mean, this is a political issue. It's about political will. It's about economies. Uh, it's, it's all that that goes into defense budgets. The same thing we go through within our internal system within the United States. The most important thing is not so much the money, but is the development of the capabilities, whatever those are, and those capability gaps that we have determined as we go through what they call NATO defense planning process. That's a continuous challenge, and it's something that uh, we, as a U.S. delegation, we will press, and especially on the political side that they will press. But because of uh, this past year, I've actually seen a a different direction a lot of the allies are going as they look at their defense capabilities. A lot of them are taking it very seriously. Are we pretty much on the same track, U.S. interests, NATO interests, European interests, or are there small little rubs? I would say in, in, the, in the big picture, yeah, we're on the same track. But understand that there are multiple threats to the alliance. It's not just what uh, Putin's been doing on the, the Russian side of the house. You have the whole issue of the southern flank, illegal immigration, you have all this stuff that's going on in the south through the uh, Mediterranean North African area. You have the Islamic ISIL and the things that they're doing, uh, and it's a direct threat to folks here in Europe. So we have a lot of common grounds. The key is how do you maintain that balance? Because you have to have the balance. You just can't throw everything in the one side or the other. It's got to be a balance to deal with the threats to NATO 360 degrees. For where you sit, the regionally aligned forces, 
that, that rotation, the heel to toe rotation, is it effective? Yes, absolutely. When we started doing the, uh, the reassurance measures, this is back, oh my gosh, almost a year ago, uh, the fact that we had regional line forces, rotational forces available was huge. UCOM and USER, most importantly, were able to remission them to other areas to do uh, reassurance exercises with allies that were wanting it and needing it. And so, yeah, absolutely huge. What are you learning in this job that should be, could be shared with the rest of the U.S. military that would make them a little bit smarter? I think number one is when you look at it from a military perspective with our allies, um, we have some great uh, allies and partners. Can't forget the partners. We're all of the same mindset for the most part. We know what's required. We know what needs to be done. We know about interoperability. We know about the value of training. The challenge, just like in any nation, to include our own, is, is the political will. And so put that aside and focus on the things that you control, which is working with your partners and your allies in the training environments that we are, or even in the operational environment. There's some strong relations, and it is about relationships. And we will struggle through the, the differences in types of equipment and technology, but we're getting better, and, and, and be, we're getting better because the last you know, 13 years that we've spent uh, dealing with the Afghanistan issue. Now we're at a, a critical point where we now need to transition to that next phase of, of how we do military operations as an alliance. And it's a two-way street. We learn from our allies, and our allies learn from us. They need the military capability. They need the political power, economic power of the United States uh, to help them uh, in their national or regional issues. And without that U.S. leadership, you know, their fear is that, okay, they won't bring the um, national elements of power to bear that, that are needed to solve a problem. Uh, but at the same time, I always caution the U.S. folks about uh, avoiding the sense of dominance or control or arrogance, worst case, uh, that sometimes comes with that. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have to be very, very wary of the fact that we need to lead, lead in the most inclusive way as possible and with a real thorough understanding of all the dynamics of a problem. And we have to buy into the fact that once we sign up to a coalition effort or to an alliance effort, we lose some of the elements of control because we're signing up to common objectives, common resources, common assessment that might be slightly different from a U.S. only uh, you know, view on all of those things. Let me get a basic starting point. What kind of operations is NATO involved in at this moment in time? Well, NATO is involved in four operations. International Security Assistance Force Afghanistan transitioning to resident support. Two is Kosovo Force, K4, which is going on 15 years. It's also in transition. Then we have two maritime operations, Operation Active Endeavor, our only Article 5 operation in the Mediterranean, uh, counterterrorism is its focus, and then Operation Ocean Shield off the Horn of Africa, Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean, countering piracy. The uh, three standing missions we have one that's, uh, frankly, a ballistic missile defense mission. It's an interim uh, capability right now, but we've got an Aegis cruiser in the eastern Mediterranean and a uh, ground-based radar in Turkey uh, that covers a, a potential ballistic missile threat from the southeast uh, over four, at least right now, four uh, NATO nations. Uh, that will grow over time. We have a, a standing uh, integrated air and missile defense mission uh, that is primarily exemplified by air policing and quick reaction aircraft across the Alliance air space. And then finally, we have the NATO support to Turkey mission right now, which is uh, a theater ballistic missile defense covering three uh, cities and their populations in southern Turkey against a ballistic missile threat from Syria. So in your position, operations and intelligence working within NATO, are there lessons that you're learning here that you could share with the military back in the States? What I most enjoy about uh, being in a, in a NATO staff position like I am now and working previously in a, in a multinational headquarters uh, is the um, absolute emphasis on inclusivity. We approach things uh, automatically from the point of view that in order to understand a problem better, we need to uh, include other perspectives uh, there, there are going to be a clash of views and perspectives in the dialogue to understand a problem because it's just natural when you bring together nations from all sorts of diverse backgrounds who have sometimes completely different world views. It's that facing every problem with the idea that you need to include and then 
merge you know, perspectives to come up with the best understanding. And then in terms of uh, developing the solution to solve a problem, uh, you get a, a lot more variety in, in the approaches, it's, uh, which NATO calls a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, for U.S. military, it's the joint interagency, intergovernmental, uh, multinational approach, uh, which is uh, not a weakness of the U.S., it's a strength. But those tend to be, uh, there's a greater emphasis on the J-I and I over the M, the multinational. Um, there's lots of practice in the States on the J-I and I. There's a bit of uh, multinational um, you know, work certainly done in the COCOMs, but uh, that's still not necessarily done um, in a uh, equal um, egalitarian basis. Uh, yeah. It's the U.S. view that presides. It's the U.S. view that dominates. And uh, we feed in other views to make sure that the U.S. solution is as best as possible or that the multinational coalition led by that you know, U.S. effort uh, is as productive as possible. In the, in the NATO way, it starts from an egalitarian basis of all nations, and, uh, and therefore it's a slightly different view. So when you look to the situation in the Ukraine and also down into ISIS, ISIL, um, how do you prepare for those kinds of threats? First, uh, you know, NATO is a, a political and military alliance, uh, and all actions are guided, directed by the nations, starting from the North Atlantic Council. But uh, that doesn't prohibit us from prudent thinking. And so we spend a lot of time early on in crises, like both of these are, uh, trying to figure out what's the implication to us, and you know, is there a, an appropriate military action that needs to be taken, either to heighten our understanding and awareness, or protect us from potential, you know, this potential threat. And so uh, in the first, first case, we are trying to um, develop understanding of the problem. And then we are then explaining the implications and recommended actions as a result of those uh, understanding the implications. Uh, sometime in that period, uh, we are generally um, paralleled, you know, by a request from the NAC for further information uh, or, cons you know, asking to consider certain things. And then it becomes a very collaborative process and trying to figure out what those uh, actions should be that might be appropriate. But uh, it's very much what we decided to do as alliance is driven by decisions from above. We try to uh, provide secure the wherewithal to provide set strategic military advice upwards that's uh, relevant to the problem at hand. And sometimes he's in the position of recommending action, and sometimes he's just in the position of saying, this is, uh, this is the threat and here are, here are implications kind of inciting some dialogue and debate that would then come back to us in a tasking uh, for potential you know, military response. So if you could reach the U.S. audience with a message that would tell them about the importance of NATO, what would you say? To a U.S. audience, I would say that NATO matters to us. It is our strongest alliance. It's the only alliance uh, that has the large numbers that it has and represents a standing military capability to do something against uh, threats to the U.S., to our allies, etc. Obviously, it implies a huge commitment on our part because, you know, we've committed ourselves to the uh, protection of all of our allies. But uh, it matters in that they bring to bear uh, capabilities and, uh, um, frankly, political legitimacy uh, to us in support of a threat that we see to the U.S. Uh, that may be part of a NATO response or uh, could be part of, as part of a separate, uh, you know, coalition or multinational response. Uh, we just need to recognize um, where some of our uh, interoperable contributions come from. They come from our experience in the alliance, our commitment to the, our European allies, and our investment time, you know, in their capabilities uh, through uh, partnering and, and uh, an alliance exercise training and operations.